Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Arpan Patel and I'm one of the pain physicians here at the Iowa Clinic. And today I wanted to discuss in simple and lay terms the process of doing radiofrequency ablation or RFA so patients can understand how and why this procedure is done. The first thing to understand about RFA is that it's not surgery. There's no cutting, there's no anesthesia required and it can be done within the office within one hour, usually about 45 minutes. It's covered by nearly all insurances, and it's a treatment option that's been available for about 30 years, although the equipment um, and the technique that we use today is uh, much more refined than it was when the procedure first came out. It's typically done for the neck pain, mid-back pain, and low back pain, which is the most common indication for why patients get radiofrequency ablation done. And for our Medicare patients, it can also be done for the knee and in the uh, low back in the area of the SI joint or the sacroiliac joint as well. Let's take a look at the anatomy. Uh, this is a more detailed lumbar spine model piece and I'm using this as the example because um, low back pain is the most common indication for why patients get radiofrequency ablation done. So on the front of the spine here, these two pieces are the bones that make up your, your spinal column and we call them vertebral bodies. In between them you have a disc. This is a shock absorber in your back. And then on the opposite side, and this is the back part of your spine, these bones are the bones that stick out, and we call them spinous processes. Those are the bones that you feel when you're touching your back. And off to the side, you have two bones here that are meeting and come together to form this joint right where the needle tip is. And these two ridges meet together to form the facet joint. The facet joint allows you to twist and bend your, your back and your spine, especially with motion. And over time, arthritis can develop here, inflammation can develop here, and that's what's depicted on the other side in the red. And as you can see here, this joint on this side is much more inflamed and larger compared to the opposite side. And the reason for that is because arthritis has developed here over time. Arthritis is bony overgrowth in an area in which it does not belong. Now, looking at the neural anatomy here, or the nerves, we have the spinal cord directly in the middle, and off towards the sides, we have nerves that are hanging and going out, and these nerves are gonna help end up going into your legs and helping you move your legs, and those are our motor branches. On the opposite side here, this model depicts smaller branches coming out of the spinal cord and going directly to that inflamed facet joint. And these are our sensory branches. So what we wanna take away from this is that there's two broad categories of nerves in our spine. We have sensory branches, which help us feel, and we have motor branches, which help us move parts of our body. And for the ablation, we're targeting the sensory branches so we can decrease the feeling at the area where we have the, where we have the arthritis to ultimately improve our pain and we're trying to stay away from the motor branches, thus preserving our function of the legs. Let's take a look at the equipment. So this is a radio frequency ablation machine. The machine uses its energy to create an electrical current. And ultimately that electrical current goes from the machine through the wiring system and ultimately ends up at the wire tip. The wire tip is then connected to another piece that acts as a conduit for that electrical current, and this is what we call a probe. The probe eventually, once the needle is appropriately paced and next to the nerve that we want to burn, the stylet is removed by the doctor and the probe then goes into the stylet, ultimately taking the current to the tip of the needle. When the current gets to the tip of the needle, the side of the needles heat up. They're parked right next to the sensory branches. like so, the tip of the needle heats up off to the side and the nerve is burned. And again, with radiofrequency ablation, we're targe targeting the sensory nerves, so the feeling at the area of the arthritis is lessened. We're staying away from the motor branches so we don't cause any nerve injury into the legs. Typically, when patients get radiofrequency ablation done, they're discharged on the same day, immediately after the procedure. You have some minor restrictions on the day of the procedure, and the next day, you're almost always able to return back to full activity. Most of the time after the ablation, it takes seven to 14 days for the patient to experience any efficacy from the procedure, because when we ablate that sensory branch, it creates a chemical reaction in that area, which then takes time 
to denervate that area, and ultimately for you to feel pain relief. Typically, the full effect of an ablation will take about three weeks, and almost always, you'll follow up with your doctor in four to six weeks to see how much improvement you've received and whether or not there's any other pain contributors left. How do you make sure that it won't get paralyzed or have a nerve injury? There's an added step called sensory and motor testing. So what happens here is when the tip of the needle is parked right next to the sensory branch, we ask the patient a series of yes or no questions that feels like a pressure, a tingle, and sometimes a twitch. This is not painful. What we're trying to do is with the needle appropriately placed, we're trying to get a combination of yes or no answers or feedback from the patient to confirm that we're near the sensory branch and away from the motor branch. Depending on the patient's answers, I'm able to then make fine-tune adjustments on the order of millimeters to make sure that my needle tip is positioned next to the nerves that I want to burn, the sensory branches, and away from the ones that I don't want to burn, and those are the motor branches. So in the first part of the stimulation here, uh, three needles are typically placed on each side of where the patient has their pain. And we start off, and you see at the top here, it says sensory and motor testing. Each electrode corresponds to each needle that's in your body. And we go one, after, one electrode after the other. We use this knob to turn up the stimulation so you're able to feel a pressure, a tingle, in that area where the needle is. And if you are able to feel it below a certain number, which in this case is 0.5, that tells me that I need less energy to get you to feel something, which means that the needle and nerve are close to each other. And that's exactly what I want. If my stimulation numbers are too high and I need a lot of energy to get you to feel something, then we know that the needle and the nerve are far away from each other and I need to make adjustments. That is the part of the sensory testing, and that is what ensures that this procedure works. The next piece is the motor testing. When we go to the motor testing portion, this is a different kind of testing. You see motor stimulation here on top. Again, we go through all three electrodes. This time, I turn up the stimulation with my machine, and the patient feels a twitch or a tap. We want the patient to feel the twitch or tap in the back. We don't want the patient to feel the twitch or tap in the leg. When the patient does not feel the twitch or tap in the leg, we know that the nerves, we know that the needle is away from the branches that allow you to move your legs. And that's how we preserve motor function. So once the sensory and motor testing looks perfect, then we go to the RFA portion. And that is where we hit thermal RFA here. You'll notice that it says thermal RFA on top. Uh, the interface of the screen has now turned red and our target temperature is 80 Celsius. I've given the patient um, a lot of numbing medicine at this point, so they're comfortable, and the feeling or sensation from this ablation should be minimal, if any. At this point, we hit the start button, and then a timer starts. When the needle gets to its target temperature of 80, 80 degrees Celsius, a timer will start, and the run of the ablation will last for one minute and 30 seconds. After the first one minute and 30 is up, we're gonna flip the needles 90 degrees. That will not hurt, it takes seconds to do. We flip the needles 90 degrees so the patient gets a nice circular burn in that area to make sure that the procedure works. And then we hit start again and run the ablation for a second run for another one minute and 30 seconds. And then the RFA is finished. Will the RFA help my leg pain? Typically pain in the legs happens from nerve compression in the low back from a disc herniation or from stenosis. Stenosis is a hole in the bone where the nerve comes out is smaller than it should be. Now, typically when we look at the spine figure, we can see the spinal cord in the middle, and we can see these motor branches that come off, off towards the side. That's where the stenosis and nerve compression happens. When it happens in the middle of the spine, we call that central canal stenosis. When it happens off to the side, as the nerves come out of the spinal cord and go into the legs, we call that foraminal stenosis. Now remember, these are motor branches. These are not branches that we can burn because these are the branches we need to protect because they provide innervation to our legs. So in this situation, the answer is that RFA is not meant for leg pain. RFA is meant for what we call axial pain along the back. It could be in the neck, the mid back, or the low back. Knee pain is an exception you can do radiofrequency ablation for knee pain. Why can't I just get a steroid injection for my arthritis? 
You can get a steroid injection uh, for the arthritis. That is certainly a treatment option. But being that the arthritis doesn't heal or go away with time, the steroid injections in this case typically wear off within three months or less. With radiofrequency ablation, you can get six to 18 months of relief or more without repeated steroid administration. And that's generally better for the health of your bones long term. The ablation can be repeated if and when the pain returns. Can the pain come back? Why doesn't the ablation last forever? Yes, the pain can come back because the nerves that we burn can grow back, and there's no way around that. Sometimes the pain comes back, but it's not nearly as bad as you remember when you started this treatment process, in which case you can put off a repeat ablation. If the pain does return, you and your doctor should decide if repeat ablation is right for you depending on how you're doing at that time clinically and how bad your symptoms are overall. Can I get back surgery to fix my problem once and for all? What if I've already had back surgery? Based on the data we have today and the studies we have today, surgeons typically operate for pain in the extremities, the arms, and the legs only. That's nerve compression at the motor branches. If that is your primary issue, then surgery may be an option for you. However, if you mostly have pain in the neck, the mid-back, or the low back, then surgery is typically not an option. If you've already had back surgery, depending on the type of surgery you've had, you may still be a candidate for an ablation. But that's a conversation that you should have with your doctor once your imaging has been reviewed. What kind of tests do I need to see if ablation is right for me? A simple x-ray at the part of the spine that's painful would be enough. I typically order this with flexion and extension. That's when you're bending forwards and backwards. So I can see if you have any slippage or any shifting in your spine with movement. We want to make sure that that slippage, if it's even there, is not bad enough where ablation is not an option. That can happen, but it's pretty rare. Typically, an MRI or a CT scan can help your doctor give you a better opinion on other types of nerve compression that you have that may be causing pain in your arms and legs. And you would get much more of an all-encompassing medical opinion during your consultation. But for the sake of radiofrequency ablation, all you need is an x-ray. That's all I have for you today. I hope this video has given you um, more understanding on radiofrequency ablation, and I hope you feel a bit more comfortable in having a discussion with your doctor on whether or not this is an appropriate treatment option for you. What I like to tell my patients is that the best time to consider radiofrequency ablation as a treatment option is when you feel that your pain on a daily basis prevents you from doing what you want to do. And that's the best time to consider this procedure.